now on TV One, we present news and information through the night via satellite from BBC World. First it was the teachers, then thousands of small farmers and health workers joined the protests, blocking roads and paralysing public services across Peru. They say they want promised pay increases to be honoured and a block on cheap imports that are destroying their livelihoods. The government, its popularity at a new low of around 14%, decided tough action was unavoidable. La tolerancia tiene un limite. Tolerance has its limits, Alejandro Toledo told the nation. In order to ensure the stability needed to attract foreign investment, the president said he had no choice but to order a nationwide state of emergency for 30 days. The armed forces and police will be deployed to guarantee personal freedoms, clear the roads and open the schools. The common theme in all these protests is the government's commitment to strict IMF budget guidelines and increased free trade. This teacher says his members are opposed to the privatization of education which these policies promote. The government points to impressive growth figures but recognizes the benefits aren't being felt widely enough. The unions are already promising a massive general strike for July. One of their leaders says that if President Toledo doesn't change his policy of kneeling to the IMF, he will have to go. Ian Bruce, BBC News. And the main news again, before I go. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, says the Islamic Republic will not bow to threats from the US. He accused Washington of trying to strip Iran of its values. The Ayatollah's remarks came in response to a tough warning from the US Defense Secretary to Iran not to meddle in the post-war destiny of neighboring Iraq. And that's all from the newsroom for now. Bye-bye. Hello, welcome to another look at the world's weather. Zooming right the way down to Australia, New South Wales until recently, very wet. Sydney was also further north, 81 millimetres in just one day. That cloud doesn't look much on the satellite picture. It's drifted away now. And for most of Australia, and you notice too, New Zealand come to that under clear skies, enjoying sunshine with this large area of high pressure. One or two showers perhaps coming into Queensland. But weather systems are going to move over towards New Zealand in the next few days bringing some rain there, especially, I think, to the more southern parts, South Island, New Zealand. But as you see, sunny and pretty warm for the time of year for most of Australia. Just the odd shower here and there, but it's a different story as rain moves into South Island, New Zealand. Heading north, the Asian scene is a mostly fine one. There were with some showers in Bangkok, and we are watching a tropical storm that has moved away from Luzon, and it could well move up towards the south of Japan at the end of the week, but more about that near the time. Heading into the Middle East, it's dry and sunny virtually everywhere, but the unsettled weather in the eastern Mediterranean is going to continue, so showers will be running into Israel as well as uh, Lebanon. For the European scene, it's getting a little bit better now, especially in the west of Europe, warmer and sunnier there, but uh, not long before some thunderstorms arrive here in London. But the eastern Mediterranean is a different story, and some of those showers are feeding along to the North African coast. Most of the showers in the equatorial regions and a little bit north and South Africa dry and sunny. May get some showers coming in there, though, at the end of the week. South America, the odd shower, Caracas, for instance, and uh, Quito. Otherwise, it's reasonably dry, reasonably settled. And we're finding showers into Canada, a little bit cooler and fresher there as well from what it has been just recently. The North American scene is a mostly dry and a mostly sunny one, as you can see here. One or two showers, perhaps, in that uh, northwestern corner there around Seattle and one or two showers too along the eastern seaboard. There's a cold front moving away at the moment. That'll be the trigger for some showers into Miami too. Right the way through the Caribbean, of course it was very wet in Jamaica just recently and still some very heavy and thundery showers brewing up and affecting that part of the world. That's the weather for now. World Business Report, next on BBC World. Now, 
more than ever, you need people you can rely on. Credit Suisse. Introducing Intel Centrino mobile technology. The new wireless laptop technology designed to help you untangle, unburden, and unwire your life. Sponsored by Credit Suisse, follow World Business Report on BBC World. You're watching BBC World. We bring you up to date with the latest financial news now in World Business Report. The euro slips back from record highs, but is the eurozone risking deflation? And a lack of passengers takes the shine off sales at Elizabeth Arden. Hello everybody, I'm Aaron Heselhurst. Thanks for joining us and of course welcome to the World Business Report. Let's start with those currencies and the euro has slipped back a few points but it's still at very high levels against the dollar. Now you may remember on Tuesday that single currency hit an all-time high against the greenback the euro surged through the $1.19 mark and the strong currency certainly making life more difficult for Europe's exporters. Now, meanwhile, manufacturers' confidence in France has remained at a 14-month low in May and the European Central Bank is now widely expected to try to offset the impact of the euro's rise by cutting interest rates at its next council meeting on the 5th of June. Well, joining me now to talk further, of course, on the subject is Hans Redeker, Global Head of Foreign Exchange Strategy at BNP Paribas. Hans, always a pleasure to see you. Welcome to BBC World. Let's start, look, uh, Eurozone deflation, a hot topic now. But you've got Otmar Issing saying that Germany's facing significant uh, deflation worries, but not so the Eurozone. Now, this is a hard task, right, for the ECB. How are they going to balance this? That is absolutely right. The European Central Bank is here in a difficult uh, situation, but uh, I believe that uh, a rate cut on the 5th of June is uh, now almost a given, and I believe as well 50 basis points. The reason why is that we are running very tight monetary conditions at the moment. We have a rising output gap in, in, in Euroland. Now the question of uh, uh, deflation developing in Euroland or in Germany, that is another issue. I believe that uh, the talk about deflation is actually now waking up politicians. It should lead sooner or later to structural reform and that is going to solve the problem. But there's, there's the key though, right? Structural reform. Germany's failed so far, right? With any, any strength or any strong structural reform. Well, actually it could be said that the past four or five years have been lost years in that respect and uh, now Schroeder has only one chance. Either he does deliver on structural reform or he is going to be forced out out of office uh, by the voter or next time. And we do see already that uh, recent election results have been mostly all negative for the SPD. Re latest opinion polls do give for the party about 25% support. That is a historic low support for the SPD. And also here in uh, the Eurozone, complaints certainly from exporters, they're being heard now. But then again, you've got with about the strong Euro, of course, but you've yeah. got uh, Issing saying that 
it's, it, he was selling a newspaper. It's, it's not a worry, but it's having an impact, right? Well, I guess that we in Euroland, we might do a mistake. And the mistake is that we, that we do see us in a situation as we were 20 years ago, small open economies where the exchange rate had a significant impact. In these days, uh, net exports are about uh, 11 or 12 percent of GDP, so much smaller than those 35 percent Germany had before. But uh, in the end, we are here seeing a significant change. And the change is that Europe had been relying on exports for five, six, seven years. And now this pillar of growth is breaking away. Hans Redeker from BNP Paribas, thanks very much for joining us. Much Thank appreciated you. as always. Okay, moving on. Cosmetics now. And cosmetics giant Elizabeth Arden has announced its first quarter loss grew to $16.7 million. That's from $10.8 million for the same quarter of last year. Now, the American company says its sales are suffering because of the SARS virus and, of course, the fall in air travel to East Asia. Makeup firms like Arden have hev uh, are heavily dependent on airport sales and stand to lose out from any drop in those passenger numbers. In the cosmetics industry, 25% of company funds go on glitzy marketing, only 3% on new product research. So when Elizabeth Arden signed up Catherine Zeta-Jones as their corporate icon last year, it thought it had done everything right. But sales, which had more than doubled between 2000 and the end of last year, flattened out in the first quarter of this one, prompting Elizabeth Arden to issue a profits warning. It blames the SARS virus for scaring people away from flying to the Far East. And it's joined 31 other major US companies in making that excuse. But then cosmetic sales are incredibly dependent on people going through airport duty-free shops. Well, if you consider that one in five people actually purchase fragrances at an airport, and also the fact that as a result of the SARS virus, um, airline passenger numbers are actually 25% um, down, then you'll see that it's going to have a significant impact on, on airport retailing. But SARS can only ever be half the story for poor revenues. Elizabeth Arden sells two-thirds of its products in the USA and half of those products in department stores. It's losing out to cheaper brands sold in cheaper outlets. Of particular concern to you know, suppliers like Elizabeth Arden who trade through uh, mainstream department stores is that these mainstream um, retail channels are suffering as discounters um, gain increasing strength in the US retail sector. But don't think for a moment the world of expensive beauty products is in any type of decline. It was in 1910 that Elizabeth Arden opened the world's first modern beauty salon and since then cosmetics has grown to be a 160 billion dollar a year industry. Americans now spend more on their beauty than they do on their education. And the rest of the world seems keen to follow suit. For example, in India, sales of anti-aging cream are growing at 40% a year. The cosmetics industry can afford to put up with many more blows like the SARS virus before it starts to look haggard. Jeremy Howell, BBC News. Well, from one set of disappointing results to another, first quarter results from Japan Telecom prompted their shares to drop by more than 10%. Strong growth in its mobile unit, J-Phone, did take the country's third largest telecom company back into profit, but it's warning there will be a 22% drop in group profit for the year, certainly due to the heavy capital expenditure on those 3G infrastructures. Luxury goods maker Gucci is to make $1.6 billion payout to its shareholders. Now, France's Pinot Proton, La Redoux, as the majority shareholder in Gucci, will get most of that. And Gucci has also announced it will make it cheaper for PPR to buy the remaining shares in Gucci. PPR has already, had already said it planned to buy the rest of Gucci by April next year. And unemployment in Ireland has risen to 4.6% in the first quarter of the year. It's compared to 4.4% a year earlier. Certainly as the global slowdown takes its toll, unemployment is forecast to reach 5.5% next year. From highs in the 1980s, unemployment fell to very low levels in the late 1990s in the Celtic Celtic Tiger boom when Ireland even had to import workers. Celtic, Celtic. OK, now the lack of tourists in places like Hong Kong and Singapore because of the SARS outbreak has had a terrible effect on business, certainly at hotels, restaurants and shops. But some companies also see the crisis as a time of opportunity for them to expand or to improve their business. It's a rare and refreshing sight. This restaurant is doing a roaring trade despite the SARS outbreak and a downturn in the Singaporean economy. 
It's luckier than most of its counterparts. In the last few weeks, several restaurants have shut down due to a lack of business. Thank you. There's no doubt that the SARS outbreak has taken a huge bite out of restaurants' profits. But not all are suffering equally. This restaurant, which serves up an affordable range of Thai food, is doing well enough to consider opening up four more new branches. Expanding its business at this time might seem risky. But thanks to the SARS crisis, the restaurant believes there are also certain benefits. I, I can see very clear-cut advantages uh, to expand in this period. Um, overall, I mean, uh, landlords are easier to talk to. Uh, contractors, your suppliers, you know, are more flexible. You know, uh, they're more hungry for business. And same for employment staff. Furniture retailer Lim Kok Kui also sees this difficult period as a time of opportunity. At this new warehouse outlet, discontinued products and slightly defective furniture are sold at huge discounts. Aside from drawing customers looking for bargains, the outlet is a place where the company can retrain its staff to improve its competitiveness. For our own staff, uh, who have more free time now, they can come back here to be retrained, to be cross-trained and to be more productive in their work. Also, we can show to our potential franchisee that we actually have a mock-up place, uh, the right complete infrastructure to train their people to operate the store. The spread of the SARS virus has wreaked havoc on businesses. But some companies are finding out that there's a silver lining in every dark cloud, if they look hard enough. Lim Shuling, BBC News, Singapore. OK, we're going to bring up the markets. European markets certainly climbing on the backs of Nokia and Axa. But we've just news out orders for US durable goods. They fell sharply in April on slumping demand for cars and military aircraft, certainly reflecting continued weakness in the US. They'd slid to 2.4%. That's it from me, Aaron Hazelhurst, and the rest of the team. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Market Boards. Sponsored by Credit Suisse. Sponsored by Credit Suisse. The isolation. It is your mind that keeps you alive. The hunger, the thirst. Perfect trail food. That's survival fishing. It's so cold, so very, very cold. I can sleep out in temperatures as low as minus 50. What was that? Anywhere along the water's edge, you're at great risk. Never fear. Ray Mears is here. Nice, dry sticks, which are perfect for friction firelighting. Ramir's Extreme Survival, part of the Voyager season. This weekend at these times on BBC World. When sport is what matters, keep pace with Sport Today, next on BBC World. you can rely on. Credit Suisse. Introducing Intel Centrino mobile technology. The new wireless laptop technology designed to help you untangle, unburden, and unwire your life.
experiences, revolutions in thought and technology. Windows of opportunity. The world is open for business. And you have the key. Diners Club International. Hello, I'm David Brenner. This is Sport Today on BBC World. And coming up on this programme, it's an all-Italian night in Manchester as Milan and Juventus vie for the Champions League trophy. Football excitement, South American style. Five goals, five sent off as River Plate go out of the Copa Libertadores. And the Ducks are not so mighty. The Devils take an early advantage in the Stanley Cup finals. Yes, all that's to come, but we start with the latest news from day three of the French Open in Paris and a marathon three-setter that finished just moments ago. And it provided quite an upset, too. The ninth seed, Daniela Hanchakova, knocked out by the young American Ashley Harkle Road. And all that after Hanchakova had pulled back from 3-5 down and survived two Harkle Road service games for the match in the third to at one point lead 6-5. Paddy Schneider early became the first player to reach the third round. The number 19 seed beat the home favourite Stephanie Cohen Aloro 3 and 6. She's been joined in the last 32 by Ai Sugiyama, seeded 16, who beat Sandra Kleinova 7 5 6 love. On day two, meanwhile, Venus Williams opened her campaign with a routine win over fellow American Samantha Reeves, while Kim Kleisters had an easy win over another American, Amy Fraser. Another step along the road in her bid to end Serena Williams' Grand Slam domination. Kim Kleisters opened the second day's play of the French Open on centre court against veteran American Amy Fraser. With the opening set wrapped up in just under half an hour, it appeared to be a procession for the second seed. And so it proved as she dropped just eight points in the second, closing out the match with a fortunate net cord. Her performance was a clear signal to the Williams sisters, who could find their domination of the Grand Slam tournaments under threat. Venus Williams was rather less convincing in her opening game against compatriot Samantha Rees. The two-time Wimbledon and US Open champion swapped breaks to serve early on, but took the first set 6-2. Rees then produced some fine tennis of her own and could have forced a tiebreaker in the second. But Williams maintained her advantage and managed to break Rees in the tenth game to book her place in the second round, 6-2, 6-4 the score. However, the third seed will have to raise her game if she's to convince not just the French public, but her own mother as well of her championship credentials. And the seventh seed, Jennifer Capriati, opened her account against South Africa's Jeanette Kruger. It took her just 53 minutes to book her place in the second round, winning 6-2, 6-1.
Meanwhile, Leighton Hewitt was also in action. He too faced an American opponent and duly took the first and second sets with relative ease. However, the Australian lost his way in the third, losing it on a tie-break. But Bahali's lack of experience on clay eventually worked in Hewitt's favour and he closed out the ninth game to win in four sets. 6-4, 6-1, 6-7, 6-3, the final score. Jeremy Betts, BBC News. Now, football. The English city of Manchester has been taken over by thousands of Italian fans ahead of the Champions League final later tonight. The home of Manchester United, of course, Old Trafford plays hosts to Milan and Juventus as they vie for the biggest prize in the European game. Souvenir t-shirt and paper, a pound. Around 50,000 Italian fans are expected in Manchester for tonight's game. Many of them are already enjoying the sunshine, cafes and bars of the city centre. And for most, this is their first experience of Mancunian hospitality. Very friendly people and uh, good bars. And, uh, yeah, we had a couple of beers and everything is, uh, yeah. I like the, like the atmosphere. Very nice, but uh, the pub uh, closed very early. I'm emotional. I'm very emotional for this night. I hope uh, um, to, to have uh, a party after the match. And this is where all those fans in the city centre are going to be coming to. Old Trafford, Manchester United's home ground, the venue for tonight's final. Juventus and AC Milan, the first time two Italian teams have contested this final, and they'll be very eager to prove that the death of Italian football has been greatly exaggerated. Juventus are the cup favourites. They recently clinched the Italian league title and knocked out Real Madrid in the semi-final. Some are saying that AC Milan are lucky to be here, but try telling their players that. Come on! An exciting game's in prospect tonight, but goals might be easier to come by in the park this afternoon. Gordon Farker, BBC News, Manchester. Don't know how to follow that. Well, Italian football may have a reputation for being overly defensive, but one of the country's leading sports writers is expecting a fine advert for Serie A. They are the top industrial cities in Italy, and the two teams are the best supported all over Italy and indeed abroad. They've got the best success rate of any Italian football, so this is really the best of Italian football. Now, further afield, the Colombian team, America di Cali, are through to the semi-finals of South America's top club competition, the Copa Libertadores. They beat River Plate of Argentina 4-1 in a tempestuous match which also saw five players sent off. Here was a game that showcased the best, followed rapidly by the worst side of the beautiful game. America scored three fine first-half goals, the first a header from Julian Vasquez on the half-hour mark. Six minutes later, Fabian Vargas danced through the river defence before slipping his pass to Vasquez to finish. 2-0 on the night, and America now into a 3-2 aggregate lead. The third was made by Kilan Viviscas. Castillo was at the front of a queue of players waiting to pounce on his cross. But just as America seemed to have taken a stranglehold over the tie, Viviscas changed the whole atmosphere of the contest, even if his ludicrous challenge on coup day in first half injury time didn't ultimately affect the result. River cut the deficit to a single goal with just over 20 minutes remaining. Diego Ludueno with a fine run and a shot to match but a potentially thrilling climax was ruined by an incident four minutes from time. America coach Fernando Castro was the catalyst for an incident that would require the intervention of the stadium's security forces to restore some semblance of order. <laughs> Referee Gustavo Mendes then displayed remarkable powers of recollection to single out the players responsible for the free-for-all. Rivers' Claudio Hussein was dismissed for violent conduct swiftly followed by teammate Dario Hussein and America's Luis Espria for their part in the brawl. Even at nine aside, the pitch remained too crowded for some, Rivers' Ariel Garce becoming the fifth red card of the game. At least America managed to finish with a flourish into a semi-final meeting with either Santos or Cruz Azul. Scott Burton, BBC News. Now, the National Hockey League playoffs have reached their season end with the New Jersey Devils and the Anaheim Mighty Ducks contesting the Stanley Cup. And it was New Jersey who took advantage of home ice in Game 1, winning 3 to nothing. 
Jeff Friesen scored the goal that brought New Jersey to, to the finals, and it was his shot that moved the Devils ahead early in the second period. The New Jersey team then made the game safe with two more goals in the third period. Patrick Elias' effort saved as he then played the puck to Grant Marshall to double the Devils' lead. The Mighty Ducks pushed to get back, but having pulled their netminder, Friesen completed the scoring into an empty net in the final few seconds. Game two in Jersey on Thursday. Well, Anaheim hadn't played for 10 days after beating Minnesota. They may perhaps have been a factor to their sluggish start to the series. Well, in all fairness to them, you could see that they were, uh, uh, they had a little bit of rust on the blades. Um, but as the game got on, they got a little bit better. And, uh, you know, I think we um, started backing off a little bit, and maybe due to tiredness or, or whatnot, but uh, we have to be better as the game goes on. As they, they're they're going to get better as the series goes on. Well, it's, you know, we're a layoff's an excuse. I mean, we had a big opportunity here tonight, and uh, we're not uh, going to make any excuses. They were better than us tonight. They executed better. They were hungrier, and you have to give them credit. Finally, the Grand Prix season moves to Monaco this weekend. Michael Schumacher looking to clinch his fourth consecutive victory of the season. After a slow start, the five-time world champion has won the last four races. He's just two points behind Kimi Raikkonen of McLaren. Ferrari again at beginning to dominate. And with the drivers only allowed one qualifying lap, skill as well as tactics will certainly come into play around the tight circuit of the Principality. Shumi, though, confident he and his team will, as ever, get it right. Well, I mean, we have sort of uh, got used to the new rules, and as well for Monte Carlo, I think we will uh, know how to deal with it, because it's, uh, it would be probably very difficult if we had to imagine the very first race with the very new rules uh, to be in Monte Carlo, because that uh, uh, would, would be very difficult. But now, in the meantime, I think we'd be well, well prepared. And it's difficult to disagree with that. Michael Schumacher ending this particular edition of Sport Today. I'm David Brenner. This is BBC World. Bye for now. Unrivaled, impartial, in-depth. BBC News is next. Great. Do you mean great in the sense that Winston Churchill was great? And let's not forget Henry VIII. And Charles Dickens. Yeah, what about Sir Isaac Newton? Charles Darwin. David Beckham. Lord Nelson died for his country. And Elizabeth the First, who was married to it. John Lennon. Sir Paul McCoy. What about Henry the Great? 
Great Britons, coming soon to BBC World. To vote for your favourite Britain, log on to bbcworld.com slash vote. Click online in 30 minutes on BBC World. Iranian leaders warn the United States, stop threatening our country. President Khatami tells an Islamic conference, Iraq must decide its own future. Three people are killed after a helicopter crashes on Mount Everest. And in Indonesia, Bali bombing suspects give evidence in the trial of Muslim cleric Abu Bakr Bashir. Hello, I'm Misha Pillay. Welcome to BBC World News. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei says the Islamic Republic will not bow to threats from the US. He accused Washington of trying to strip Iran of its values. The Ayatollah's remarks came after the US Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld issued a tough warning to Iran not to meddle in the post-war destiny of neighboring Iraq. Mr. Rumsfeld warned Iran it was on notice any attempt to remake Iraq in Iran's image would be aggressively put down. Washington has also accused Tehran of harboring members of Al-Qaeda and of trying to develop nuclear weapons. Mr. Rumsfeld has also claimed that Saddam Hussein's regime may have destroyed its weapons of mass destruction before the war began, but he said it would take time to check all the suspected sites. The 57 member countries of the Organization of the Islamic Conference gathered for the opening session to hear the Iranian president call for an elected government in Iraq as soon as possible. All Islamic countries expect a political regime chosen by the Iraqi people to quickly take control, President Khatami said, and he insisted it was a demand supported by world public opinion. Democratic elections would be likely to put Iraq's Shia majority into power, a move which Iran would welcome, having sheltered key Iraqi opposition figures in recent years. The Syrian delegate stressed the need for broader representation. It must be broadly presenting all spectrum, political spectrum in Iraq, all ethnic and religious groups. Without naming the United States and British coalition, President Khatami finally called for the occupying powers to leave Iraq. The Americans had earlier warned Iran in strong terms not to meddle in Iraq's affairs. Interference in Iraq by its neighbors or their proxies will not be permitted. Indeed, Iran should be on notice that efforts to try to remake Iraq in Iran's image will be aggressively put down. The Americans have been increasing the pressure on Iran, part of what President Bush called the axis of evil, and accusing Iran of developing nuclear weapons. And American intelligence has suggested that the recent suicide bombings in Saudi Arabia were the work of al-Qaeda operatives in Iran. Iran said it did not support al-Qaeda, nor did it have secret nuclear facilities. In Iraq, despite small finds of chemicals like these and a mobile factory empty of its supposed biological contents, which inspectors will investigate, no weapons of mass destruction have been found. Mr. Rumsfeld argued there was a reason. It could be because it's hard to find things in a country that's determined not to have you find them. And uh, we'll just take our time and we'll go about that business. Weapons of mass destruction were the coalition's main reason for the invasion of Iraq. For Iraqis, the main concern is security and rebuilding the country. The top priority promised by the new UN envoy to Iraq, who plans to begin work by next Monday. Jane Bennett Powell, BBC News. Joining from us from Tehran is the BBC's Jim Muir. Jim, the rhetoric from the Iranian leadership suggests otherwise, but is Iran at all concerned about these threats from the US? I think they're paying heed to it, and, uh, but in a sense, um, they've heard it 
all before, uh, to the extent that for, for the last 23 years they've had pressures and threats of one sort or, or another from the states, and that's the way they're casting this. They're at least uh, making out that they see nothing very special in it, just uh, more of the same. Uh, as, uh, for example, the, um, the charges of meddling in Iraq, they say that the Americans are looking around for um, scapegoats because they've realized that they're getting a bit out of their depth, that they've uh, bitten off the more that they can chew, and uh, they're re realizing some of the realities of uh, Iraqi social uh, composition and so on. Uh, they've got a problem and they're blaming somebody else for it. That's the way it's being put here. But the Americans are using the possible threat of aggression, at least Donald, Donald Rumsfeld is. Um, that's something of a, of a development, isn't it? And linking it in a speech which is also looking at the possible <coughs> development of nuclear weapons by Iran? Well, yes. I mean, there's, there's three accusations here. One relating to um, weapons of mass destruction, uh, meddling in Iraq, and, um, of course, also uh, supporting Al-Qaeda or harboring Al-Qaeda. Now, Iranians are saying that, uh, yes, they do have a few Al-Qaeda people here who are in custody and in under interrogation, uh, but uh, they will be passed on as soon as they've been identified. Um, I don't think that the Iranians fear uh, an imminent Amer American military move, or indeed even a, a in, in, the, in the middle range of time. Uh, also, I think they feel pretty secure that there's not a lot the Americans can do in terms of the other alternative, which is being advocated by hardliners in Washington, which is trying to support uh, some kind of insurrection or uprising by Iranian people, because uh, that's really uh, hard to imagine happening in current circumstances. So I, I think the uh, Iranian leadership is watching very closely. Uh, they are concerned, but I don't think they're running scared at the moment. Jim in Tehran, thank you. A Russian-built helicopter carrying nine people has crashed just outside the perimeter of Everest Base Camp. Of the nine people on board, three were killed, all Nepali crew members. The accident happened on the fifth day of celebrations to mark the conquest of Everest by Tenzing Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary. The helicopter was coming in to pick up a group of climbers. In order to land, it had to circle over base camp. Then, just as it neared the helipad, its wheels clipped a building. The rotor blades can be seen flying in the air, but luckily the whole the helicopter, helicopter didn't, didn't explode in flames. Back. Instead, it smouldered on the ground. Well, it's doing things right. It's the helicopter just crashed. Helicopter correct, correct. Crash, crash, crash. The wreckage was soon surrounded by people trying to lift it up and pull out the survivors and the dead who were trapped beneath. The helicopter behind me crashed about 15 minutes ago. We think they've pulled some people from the wreckage but the terrible thing is there are still live pilots or possibly passengers trapped underneath in this glacial stream which is freezing cold. Everyone's trying to lift up the helicopter some way to get them free, but without the equipment, any lifting gear or any real metal poles, it's difficult. Tenzing Sherpa saw the accident itself. Because they're trying to land, but the, near the edge of the one of the small uh, uh, houses and the little stone and the backside the wheel. First, they must the wheels break and they come down and the couples and they crash down there. So the, the wheels caught a house. Yeah. The dead and injured were then flown out in a Nepali army helicopter. Tom Heap, BBC News, Everest Base Camp. In Indonesia, a key witness has told a court in Jakarta that he was involved in the Bali bombings last year, in which more than 200 people were killed. The man known as Mukhlas is one of four Bali suspects giving evidence in a separate trial. That's of an Indonesian Islamic cleric, Abu Bakr Bashir, who's accused of treason. Mukhlas told the court that he was one of a small group of people involved in the Bali bombings. He said Abu Bakr Bashir knew nothing of the attacks. The cleric isn't a suspect in the Bali bombings themselves. He is accused of giving the go-ahead for a series of fatal church bombings in December 2000. Our correspondent Rachel Harvey was in the courtroom in Jakarta. It's been a fairly dramatic day all round, to be honest. It's built up from fairly inauspicious beginnings. The first suspect, Ali Imran, who's uh, Moklas's kid brother, he was quite reticent. Every now and again, he'd let out a bit of a giggle. But beyond that, he had to be pushed quite hard in his questioning. He did, in the end, say that he knew Jamaat Islamiyah, this Islamic extremist group, existed. In fact, he said that he was a member. But he didn't know what Abu Bakr Bashir's role in the organisation was. The next witness, who was called Mubarak, 
similar answers, different circumstances. He was saying he was elsewhere in Indonesia, but again, he had a handler, as he called him, who told him that Abu Bakr Bashir was in charge, but he didn't know that himself personally. Then we had Muklas, who arrived to huge cheers of Alo Akbar, God is great, from his supporters outside the court. He gave a, a clenched fist salute, a huge grin on his face, and for the next couple of hours in court, he was cracking jokes, avoiding direct questions about Jamaat Islamia. But he did say, as, as you said in your introduction, that he was involved in the Bali bombings. He answered it in, in answer to a question where he was asked, well, what role did Abu Bakr Bashir play? And he said, well, he, he'd had nothing to do with bombs. This was just us, just a small group. Rachel Harvey reporting. In Saudi Arabia, five men have been arrested in connection with the recent suicide bombings in the capital Riyadh. The arrests were made in the Muslim holy city of Medina. A Saudi source said one of those arrested is believed to be one of the key architects of the Riyadh attacks. 34 people died in the three bombings earlier this month. The human rights organization Amnesty International says world governments are using the war on terror as an excuse to abuse human rights. The organization's annual report says the aftermath of the attacks of September 11th has made the world a more dangerous place by curtailing human rights and shielding governments from scrutiny. Amnesty International says the detention by the US of over 600 people at the Guantanamo Bay military camp is a human rights scandal. The prisoners are being held without charge or trial. It warns that Iraq could go the way of Afghanistan if no effort is made to restore law and order and respect human rights. And the report says Russia is carrying out serious human rights violations in Chechnya and is routinely using torture to extract confessions. Amnesty International claims the war on terror is being used as an excuse to trample on human rights. It says that despite the huge sums being spent on security, people around the world are feeling more insecure than at any time since the end of the Cold War. In particular, it attacks the United States for holding more than 600 people without trial in Guantanamo Bay. It wants them charged or released immediately. Britain too is condemned for keeping 11 foreign terrorist suspects locked up in high security jails, again without being charged. Amnesty says these are inhuman or degrading conditions. Around the world, governments, particularly repressive regimes, have used the war against terrorism as a license to uh, intensify their oppression of political opponents, of dissidents in China, in Egypt, in Philippines. Around the world, we see a rolling back of civil liberties in a way that we have never seen before. Today's report also highlights what it calls the forgotten victims of human rights abuses in countries beyond the media spotlight. And it says that in Afghanistan, millions of people still face an uncertain future because of a lack of long-term investment and the failure to create a functioning legal and judicial system that respects human rights. It warns there's a very real risk that Iraq will face similar problems. Andy Tai, BBC News.